One of my favourite things to show my kids is the launch of Apollo 11. Astronauts report it feels good. T-minus 25 seconds. The video is more than 50 years old, but NASA shot it on high-speed 65mm film and it looks incredible. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12. The first thing they asked me is whether this really happened. And yes, it did. 95% sure that the moon landing was real. Three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff. As the rocket started to launch, my son asked me why all the paint was falling off. And it does kind of look like that. Giant white sheets of stuff are falling off the rocket, almost obscuring some of the close-up shots. I told him that's ice, which is collected on the outside of the rocket, because the fuel inside the rocket is colder than you can possibly imagine. This didn't make sense to my kids. Why would a very hot thing be powered by very cold fuel? And yet... Tower cleared. Roger all. The cold fuel works. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. But that giant leap was kind of as far as we got. NASA reached the moon, visited it a few more times to hit golf balls around and pick up rocks, and then lost interest in it. We started, but we never completed. We stopped. Soon afterwards, the Soviet Union lost interest too. And for four decades, the only human activity on the moon was a few spaceships that crashed into it while trying to do something else. But now, there's a new rush on it. And liftoff of Artemis The US, China, Russia and India are all sending missions to the moon. And all to the totally unexplored South Pole. Why? Well, in order to make the next giant leap, we need a petrol station on the moon. And these countries are all rushing to build one. In this episode, how a discovery made a century ago will allow us to use the moon as a stepping stone to explore the solar system. I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. Exploration is what humans do. But a hundred years ago, the idea of leaving the planet and exploring the universe was considered fanciful and ridiculous. So ridiculous that in 1920, when a man named Robert Goddard thought he'd figured out how to do it, the New York Times published a long editorial screed making fun of him. Robert Goddard had been trying to get to space since he was a teenager. At age 17, he'd climbed a cherry tree in his Massachusetts backyard to cut off dead branches and wondered what it would be like to just keep climbing. He had a vision of a rocket rising from the meadow below into space and decided he would spend the rest of his life making that a reality. When he became a physics professor at Clark University in Massachusetts, he wrote a paper suggesting rockets could take humans to space. He said to achieve it, you would need multiple rockets attached to each other. One would push the others up and then drop away and another one would take over. To illustrate it, he included some theoretical calculations for getting a rocket to carry a small load to the moon. The New York Times got hold of his paper and decided he was an idiot because rockets don't work in space. To claim that it would is to deny a fundamental law of dynamics. He seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. Goddard became very famous. Uh, he became very famous, but not in a particularly good way. He was sent insulting letters for years and started to operate in secrecy. He struggled to get funding for his research because people thought it was ridiculous. When he conducted a test of one of his rockets, the papers joked that he had only missed the moon by 298,000 miles. Lol. Now, these naysayers did have some valid questions, like, how can a rocket push you forward in a vacuum when there's nothing to push against? And how do you set fire to your fuel when one of the key ingredients of fire, oxygen, 
is very much unavailable in space. Well, Goddard had solved both of those problems. He figured out that the nothing to push against thing was wrong in high school and proved it with experiments. And he realised that the solution to the no oxygen problem is to bring oxygen. In 1926, Goddard decided to run a little experiment. He was standing on his Aunt Effie's farm with his wife Esther and some colleagues, all dressed in suits and hats because it was 1926. They had a camera pointing at a little scaffold with a rocket perched on top. But he didn't need it to be big. He was just trying to prove his theory that everything you needed to send a rocket into space could be found in water. Water is made up of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Zap water with electricity to split it into oxygen and hydrogen gas. Cool them down until they turn into liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen and you have the two ingredients you need for a powerful but controllable rocket. It was a brilliant idea, and it worked. The rocket took off at 100 kilometres an hour, flying 12 metres up. It wasn't much, but it was enough. Goddard had proved that liquid oxygen and hydrogen could be used to power a rocket. 49 years after the New York Times' editorial, they issued an apology to Robert Goddard. Rockets clearly worked in space. How did they know this? Because one was on its way to the moon, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on board. Aldrin was carrying with him a tiny copy of Robert Goddard's autobiography. Goddard had died 24 years earlier. He never saw a man-made rocket in space, but every single space mission was made possible by his discoveries. Getting Apollo 11 from the Earth to the Moon needs about one and a half Olympic swimming pools worth of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. But the Moon is only a three-day journey from Earth. Mars is a bit further than that. The problem with Mars is that it is a six-month trip one way, best case. For a mission to Mars, you need a much bigger ship, and that means you need much more fuel. The fuel would be so heavy that just carrying it into space from Earth would cost billions of dollars. But what if you don't have to get your fuel from Earth? What if you can make the fuel somewhere that gravity isn't as much of a problem? In the 1980s, we discovered ice on the moon. Scientists were so stunned they insisted on more research before last night's announcement of the discovery. The ice isn't on the bright, dusty equatorial regions that Apollo astronauts visited to do donuts. That max acceleration? He's got about two wheels on the ground. No, the ice is hidden in shadows in a much less fun part of the moon. The spacecraft identified what appeared to be a huge crater full of ice. Just like on Earth, the south pole of the moon has a lot of ice. It's in the bottom of craters, in permanent shadows, where the sun can't melt it. And what's in ice? Hydrogen and oxygen, the very things that we need to make rocket fuel. Apart from drinking water, it could be used to grow food, supply oxygen, even make rocket fuel. It's cold down there. It's like moon Antarctica. And one day it will likely host a rocket refueling station, or possibly several. They'll look like fuel refineries, big industrial processes. There's even more ice on Mars Antarctica, and in the Mars Tick, you know, at the top bit where Mars Santa lives. Ho, ho, ho! So if we ever get to Mars, we could use that ice to make enough fuel to get home. Removing the need to yeet all our fuel into space from the Earth's surface makes deep space exploration much more viable. While we've known about ice on the moon since the 90s, recent discoveries have found significantly more ice than expected. And that is what has started a new race to the moon. In the US, the Trump administration was keen to get involved in the race to Moon Antarctica, 
particularly due to Vice President Mike Pence being a space nerd. Because Mike's very much into space. But it wasn't the Americans who got there first. India tried first, but lost control of the lander at the last moment, and it crashed. I realise there's no sound in space, but this is a podcast, and I can do what I like. Next to give it a try was Russia. Августа Луна 25 должна выйти на окололунную орбиту. Now, this was Russia's 10th moon landing attempt, so you'd expect that they would do better than India's first, but nope. Luna 25 left a 10 meter wide crater after hitting the surface of the moon at over 200 kilometers an hour. NASA helpfully made a little gif of the impact site. <laughs> Three days later, attention turned back to India. We, are, we were hovering and now we are approaching the moon's surface. In the control room in Bengaluru, tensions were extremely high. The Prime Minister was watching on. We can see the Honourable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji, who is here to encourage us. This time, they managed to slow down. Sir, we have achieved soft landing on the moon. India is on the moon. India's successful moon landing was also incredibly cheap. The price tag was lower than most Hollywood blockbusters set in space. They had proved it's cheaper to go to the moon than pretend to go to the moon. After landing, India dispatched its rover, which has started exploring the area at an extremely sedate 36 meters per hour, which is slightly slower than a fast snail. Now, the South Pole on the moon isn't that big. It's about the size of Tasmania. And across it is about enough ice to fill Sydney Harbour. There's a lot of countries trying to get their hands on this small area of ice. And the US and India aren't exactly best buds with Russia and China. A turf war over Moontarctica, I mean, it wouldn't be great. The US administration created the US Space Force and the US Space Command as military organizations, ostensibly because... Space. Going to be a lot of things happening in space. Because space is the world's newest warfighting domain. And they're not talking about robot wars either. I'm trying to put boots on the moon. Boots on the moon. By 2026, the US will be regularly sending humans to the moon too. China plans to follow them in 2030. Mining ice is going to be complicated and hazardous enough without the threat of humans fighting each other. Go, go, go! Particularly given that the nearest hospital is 400,000 kilometers away. A lot of people think it would be nice if there were some kind of laws in place to control what happens in space. There is something called the Moon Agreement of 1979. The uh, Moon Agreement called for all profits made in space to be distributed to uh, all countries, especially those in need. American space entrepreneurs like this guy, Jim Benson, weren't huge fans. It just was a uh, sort of a communistic approach to, to space that really could have put a complete damper forever on the exploration development of space. Australia signed it but none of the countries with actual space programs did. In 2020, the Trump administration expressly rejected the Moon Agreement. Instead, Trump, or realistically, Mike very much into space, Pence, put forward the Artemis Accords, which encourage countries to cooperate peacefully, act transparently and responsibly, and rescue people who get into trouble while mining in space. Australia signed that too. Anything to do with mining, we will sign it. Boy, oh boy, do we love mining. They you want to send these boys into space, fine. I'm sure they'll make good astronauts. They don't know jack about drilling. Now, 28 countries have signed it, including India. But China and Russia have not signed it. During the Age of Discovery on Earth, when European explorers sailed around the world looking for new lands and treasures, resupply ports were often sites of conflict. That was hundreds of years ago. Now, the new frontier of exploration is space. The question is, how much have we changed since then?
G'day, Matt here. I've stepped into this strange void to tell you that if you want to watch or listen to more episodes of If You're Listening, you can do it right now. You can listen to them on the ABC Listen app, or you can watch more episodes here on YouTube or on ABC iView as well. You can also watch these things. And now, does anyone, can anyone get me out of this void? Yeah, I don't know how I got here.